And, of course, we must think of the manipulatory possibilities of television. It has its own tremendous possibilities. Violence broke out again last night as some young people were prevented from meeting peaceably in the downtown area by noticeably nervous, if not to say, trigger-happy police. Frank Bushman, attorney for the young people who are to be arraigned in court tomorrow morning, pointedly remarked on this overreaction by the police. Late last night, disorder broke out among a small, unruly mob as our guardians of the peace quietly and efficiently, in spite of extreme provocation, restored order. I command you to disperse. And if you do not, you shall be arrested for refusal to disperse. You have two minutes to disperse. It is important that our courts make an example of these hoodlums and hand out the kind of sentences they so richly deserve. We staged this scene. We filmed it to show the television can tell any story that it wants to tell. In both versions, the action was the same, and the actors did exactly the same things. However, the camera was placed differently. The editor edited differently, and the announcer told a different story. We would be naive not to realize that what we're seeing is an edited symbol. But the nature of TV is such, we see it with our own eyes, that we naturally look at it as though it were objective truth. For many, what they see on television is more true than what they see with their eyes in the external world. media can be used by an authoritarian manipulating government or an elite. The elite gives the arbitrary absolutes and then not only TV but all the mass media can be used for manipulation and a plot or conspiracy are not needed. All that is needed is that the people in the places of influence and those who decide what is the news have in common the modern results of humanism, the modern worldview, which we have considered at length in this series.
to win the perspective, the worldview of the elite coincides with some of the influential news carriers. It does not have to be all. Then, either consciously or unconsciously, the media becomes an instrument for manipulation. Hey, what's up everybody? Just wanted to make a video, chew on a few thoughts, mumble on some musings, and boy, is it hard to get away from the whole non-stop progression of ritualistic junk just going on all over the place, and all these controlled narratives that are now overlapping and intermixing, you know, obviously just the timing of uh, everything. And you've got the lockdown, which goes on and on, and it's right on the verge of, oh, we're, we're phasing the reopening and all that. We're getting back to normal, but it's, it's the new normal, of course. And contact tracing and introducing all these ideas and strategies and everything. And then we have this historic flight, the first flight in what, nine years or whatever from U.S. soil. Or 11, is it 11 years? <laughs> um, oh, but it's it's this historic moment for America. Launch America. That just the slogan right there. And it's as we're <laughs> as we're relaunching the the American economy and relaunching life and getting everyone's getting just itching to get out of their their lockdowns and their quarantines and their socially distanced frustrations. Then we we give them some hope and we give them something positive to. So it's a distraction and also a you know a false narrative of its own. And the amazing thing is like how the fakery just is so, <laughs> it's so textbook right down to the, the loss of the video feed when the, when the rocket lands. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, <laughs> no shame. I, I don't even know anymore. I think it, this has to be intentional. Like th this is so, so sloppy. I can't be, you know, the same astronaut <laughs> who however many years ago busted for grabbing the, the, the guy's wire next to him. And here he is. Still, still the the best uh, choice for somebody to send into this privileged uh, mission. Back to the the space station. It's almost comical, but I mean, yeah, launch America, and it's I'm sure not news to anybody that the the logo is a pretty obvious depiction of of the phoenix, and which I'm sure requires no elaboration at this point for anyone who. <laughs> who knows enough to even know what the heck we're talking about at all. So, but yeah, there it is. And uh, all, all the familiar Masonic nonsense going on. But meanwhile, down on the ground, I mean, the protests, of course, spark nationwide and worldwide even. And uh, here in Portland, they actually had a thing the other day where they all marched out onto the Burnside Bridge and laid down on their stomachs with their hands behind their backs, you know, in the in the position, like, solidarity with Floyd. And again, right there, you're looking at something like you know, the irony, right, of when you think about these things symbolically and ritualistically and the whole people participating in and getting swept up in things and doing things that where they don't even understand the... And all these things colliding together. So you got people <laughs> protesting all, all bunched together into a giant crowd, which is a sin in the era of social distancing, but they're wearing masks saying, I can't breathe on some of them. Because <laughs> that's the slogan, you know, the solidarity with, with Floyd. Um, I can't breathe. And meanwhile, I, I go outside and my, my neighbor lady is like gardening in her front yard wearing a, a face mask, but she... <laughs> You know, where people literally believe they they can't breathe, like they can't, they're not allowed to to just breathe normally because it's too dangerous. 
But now, of course, the the national narrative is all about the debate of institutional racism and, and systemic racism and the police. But again, none of these narratives are new. These are all very old things that have been reintroduced and reignited and you know many times and they're just kind of all feeding off of each other to where you have this weird you know we talk about the hegelian dialectic idea understandably because it's in everything they do but now you, you have like so many of them going on these multiple problem reaction solution agendas right in the name of public health in the name of peaceful protests versus rioting and, and all these things and they're kind of like all mixing together and cross-pollinating into these weird hybrid kaleidoscopes of drama-based mind control. This fractalized trauma-based mind control. That's really what everything is. It's bringing the public in deeper into this very fractured and, and hypnotized and controlled state. Even when it comes to the outrage, right? Because, I mean, yeah, again, timing. Right at the end of this uh, period of unprecedented worldwide lockdown, where millions of jobs have been lost and all sorts of tensions are rising and, and frustrations and people questioning the narrative and, and all this, and then, you know, what a perfect timing to have riots and protests, but not because people are were actually at the point of hitting the streets because of opposition to the lockdown. I mean, yes, there were there were some protests, but not not like this. So it's it's this kind of polarized thing, just as always. At night is when all the rioting happens and the destruction and the looting and all that. But then during the day, it's peaceful protests and solidarity with the police and, you know, riot cops and, and stuff like that. And they're kneeling together. And wow, how beautiful is that? Because, hey, the, the police are part of the heroes, right? They're supposed to be part of the hero class. So it's a paradox that we got to solve got to overcome, right? So you get kneeling protesters and kneeling policemen and then even policemen, yeah, kneeling in solidarity with the, the, the cry for justice and it, it, all with their masks on and six feet apart. So it's like, it's an extension of the ritual that was created in the past few months where the first responders, the heroes, you know, clapping in solidarity and standing six feet apart and now they're kneeling Colin Kaepernick style, with their masks on. We can't breathe, can't touch, but we can kneel. We can all bow. Kneel to each other. Because we're all in charge. Right? Because that's what justice looks like. In the eyes of the world, I, I suppose. That's the idea of justice we're supposed to cry out for. I mean, the issue of racial injustice, just like so many other screwed up things in the world and evil things in the world, is one that ultimately you can't adequately address without understanding that it, it's a spiritual issue. And that only reconciliation with God through Christ is the, the kind of brotherhood that destroys all that kind of hatred towards your, towards your neighbor for whatever reason, whatever prejudice people might succumb to. That's not to say that there's no such thing as systemic racism, quote-unquote. But really it's only true because there, there are sinful people in the system to make, which is what makes it systemic. That's true for police officers, that's true for politicians, that's true for <laughs> bankers and billionaires and, and everybody else. Yeah, and speaking of which, it reminds me, yesterday I got a chance to watch a, a really good documentary that came out by a guy named Leonard Ulrich. Some of you are probably familiar with him, many are probably not, but he did one about four years ago on the New World Order and Bible Prophecy. And this one is Volume 2, The Illusion of Money. And um, it's a, just a fantastic piece of research that uh, he just put out a couple days ago. Well, there'll be a link in the description, and I definitely recommend it to anybody. Maybe you're familiar with it, and maybe you're not, and it's a great, I think, resource for, you know, whether you're just now learning about it or not. But 
Um, he really takes a very broad historical approach, going all the way back to the, the Kingdom Age and the Age of Empires and, and colonialism and everything, and all the way up to the modern day and the creation of not just the Federal Reserve, but all kinds of things, you know, from the Dutch East India Company to the Rothschilds to Smedley Butler. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty deep dive, but it's one that... Um, I think boils down a lot of very complex, convoluted stuff to their essence of like how the deception really works, how the systemic fraud and control and injustice occurs on a level that is so much bigger and harder to even comprehend, you know, on, on this worldwide banking cartel level than uh, things like corrupt cops, who ultimately are just pawns of bigger agendas. Corrupt cops and the corrupt uh, politicians and even Bill Gates and all these guys are just being used to bring the world through all these events and these narratives and through these orchestrated trauma events to bring the world to the point where it, it is crying out for, you know, real leadership. real justice in the way that humanity wants to think of justice. Humanistic justice, where God is not part of the equation. But yeah, the new normal, right? I mean, it's like no sooner did I, I put up this, uh, yeah, do I put up an obnoxious video looking at some of the new social distancing software and tracking software that's been coming out in the past few weeks. And uh, it's like the next day the news is talking about, turns out now we have another application, another use for all this type of technology, contact tracing. All you looters, all you looters are thinking you're getting away with that. We're going to come knocking. Don't worry, we're going to come find you. But the best part about this uh, documentary, The Illusion of Money, is that he deep dives into all the history and, and a lot of the mechanics of these financial, you know, coups is basically what they, they are. How the world has really been slowly conquered and uh, developed, the, you know, a, a system of debt slavery that the debt slaves don't even know exists. And we can direct our frustrations and angers or our hopes and <laughs> and trust you know, either way, in, in false directions and false narratives that are always provided rather than at, at the bigger picture. But then the biggest picture of all being that there is no human solution. There is no political solution or economic solution to a spiritual problem. That's what, why I think uh, Ulrich just nails it and brings it home back to what the whole point of all this research and all this truth community is, is the truth of Christ and the truth of eternal life through faith in Jesus. Because any other way, you just see how like one lie just feeds off another lie and everything's just reactionary. Everything's just human beings yeah, being tossed to and fro by every every sort of teaching and propaganda and uh, emotional reaction, you know, whether it's fear of dying from a disease or fear of being killed by a policeman, you know, or the fear of China or whatever. It's all fear. Except for the astronauts, who are just cool as cucumbers. <laughs> Never seem nervous at all that they're traveling 17,000 miles an hour, just, you know, are still alive after the first human flight in a, in a new capsule. <laughs> Dude, it's a crazy world that man has made for himself. But I think with all the, um, yeah, this whole launch America kind of idea, at least the way I've been thinking about it, this relaunch, you know, America even greater than before, is about launching back to a new normal where, okay, yeah, boots on the ground and finally getting the, the types of uh, militarized police presence like we've been building up and training in Iraq and Afghanistan for all these years and we can start introducing that into here and it's it's not even just a oh just a weekend thing or whatever it's the kind of thing that'll just continue on in pockets for whatever reason you know maybe for a while it'll it's it'll be outrage over racism but uh, at some point if if people are, are are rioting or protesting because you know they're just there's I don't know something like no food or whatever other uh, injustices or grievances people might have for various reasons in the coming months and years. 
there's a desensitization element to, to I think, all of this, where you know, riots and burning buildings and burning cop cars and odd cases of civilians driving their cars into crowds and, yeah, just chaos. Oh, we've got to bring order out of the chaos, so... Just bringing order out of chaos is kind of the new normal, right? And this, yeah, this weird, just the weird, I mean, the idea of, like, throngs of protesters who are so mad, but then they're still, but they're still wearing their masks, still compliant to, you know, a, a bigger, much more insidious threat to your civil liberties and existence and your very humanity, I talk about systemic racism or elitism. If you really understand eugenics and the history of eugenics, which uh, Ulrich does actually talk about that too in Illusion of Money. Um, the, all these things just dwarfs anything that's going on in a local precinct or a city or even a, a single country. Well, this globalist dehumanization of all humanity, not even just one particular race. Where, like, yeah, everyone who's not part of the dream of the New World Order, in their eyes, is, is expendable for the greater good. You know, like all the millions of unborn children that are sacrificed in the name of public health. Protecting you, protecting your health, protecting your way of life. How many more innocent human lives have been tragically sacrificed of every race because of our own hypocrisy and our own idolatry and people crying out for justice? You know, that's the ironic thing, right? It's like the more people today are crying out for justice. One day justice is going to come. Not just for the specific things that we want justice for, but on everything, for everyone. And on that day, there won't be anything to, to hold on to or stand upon other than the blood of Jesus. And that's what we have to remember to stand on now too. <laughs>